Welcome back to the sixth and final segment, Escaping the Dark Forest. For those who aren't familiar, Escaping the Dark Forest is an unofficial sequel to Dan and George's Ethereum is the Dark Forest that I wrote in around 20, September of 2020. It's a dramatic retelling of the time that several white hat hackers and myself got together to rescue about 25,000 Ethereum, or about 9.6 million US dollars at the time, worth of vulnerable funds. Although it's, we tried to stay close to the truth, uh, there wasn't much room for technical details, and so in this segment, I'm going to be going over some of the uh, some of the details that I didn't get to mention in the blog post. So to start, as we all know, the story starts out uh, with me looking through the contracts. Uh, here's the contract, or at least a snippet of it. It's about 2.2 thousand lines long, which is quite a lot of code, and to manually go through all this code would be quite the daunting challenge. And so I employed some of the strategies I mentioned in previous segments. Specifically, I started out by looking for places where Ether would be transferred out, because that's obviously where all of the really important stuff is happening. And if I could somehow break this function, then I would be able to steal Ether from the contract. So then I searched the contract for every usage of transfer ETH. There was this one here, but unfortunately, this transfers to a hard-coded address, and so this function would be useless in terms of exploits. The second usage here transfers the ETH to another hard-coded, or rather to a, an address that we don't control. This is the bond token contract. And so in terms of, in terms of an exploit, this function would also be uh, not very useful. However, this third function here transfers ETH to the sender. Uh, so taking a closer look, we see that this function will take a bond group ID and some amount of bond tokens, and then it will first ensure that the bond has not has already matured. And then if it has matured, it will burn the requested amount of bond tokens from each bond in the bond group, and then finally uh, return some ether to you. So this is a pretty standard burn function, and this implies that in order to trigger this transfer ETH call, we would need both a valid bond group as well as enough bond tokens for each bond in the bond group. So then the next question I had was, how do we get a valid bond group? To answer that, I basically searched for usages of this bond group list variable and checked for which functions would write to it. As it turns out, there was only one function, register new bond group. We can see that there's no, uh, there's no modifiers on this function, which means that we can call it. Uh, we see it takes in an array of bond IDs as well as maturity. And we have to pass the validation in a certain bond group before we can actually uh, create the new bond group here. So the next question is obviously, how do we, what, what sort of assertions are being made? And you'll notice that I've sniffed out a lot of code here. In fact, this code is rather complex. I still haven't bothered understanding it to this day. But that's because immediately you'll notice that uh, it's possible to pass in an empty array for bond IDs. And if you do that, then you bypass all of this validation. A uh, num of breakpoints remains at zero, which means that this array is empty. All of this is bypassed because your bond IDs is empty, and then all of this is bypassed because your array breakpoints is empty. What I'm basically getting at is, if you submit an empty array for bond IDs, you pass all the validation. And then if we go back, we'll notice that if you have an empty array as bond IDs, you also don't need to burn any bond tokens which means that you can basically withdraw all of the ETH you want because there's no validation being performed. Okay, so obviously this is kind of bad. Uh, it puts every single way of ETH in the contract at risk. So my next step was to find out whose contract it was. Unfortunately, th in this case, there weren't any comments in the contract that would uh, lead me to any hints about who the owner was. Usually there's a copyright header or a website link or something, but in this case, there was none of that. I tried Googling the contract address and there were also no results for that. Typically, what you might find is that uh, in the announcement blog post, the protocol would like to post the address of the contract to say, hey, this is where we deployed it, but that wasn't here this time. I tried Googling the contract name and from there, I found this blog post, uh, which led me to the protocol uh, Lean Finance if that's how you pronounce it. But then I ran into another problem. The entirety of the team was anonymous, and so I couldn't be sure whether the admin in the Telegram group was a core dev, or maybe just some social media manager that they hired from elsewhere. 
obviously I wanted to make sure I was reporting this bug to the right person, given that there was about $10 million at risk and anyone could exploit it. I noticed on their website that they had been audited by both Consensus and Certic, so I tried contacting, I tried contacting Consensus first because I'd worked with them in the past. From there, it didn't take me long to get in touch with Alex, Alex Wade, who is an auditor at Consensus. We, I briefed him on the situation, and then we discussed uh, possible solutions. One of the solutions we considered was to simply publish an announcement, being extremely vague, but just telling users that they should withdraw. However, this is obviously not great because it immediately tips off the attackers that something has gone wrong, and it might take users anywhere from hours to days to see the message. Another option was to use the exploit to rescue the funds ourselves. However, as we talked about earlier, uh, there are such things as front-running bots, and in fact, and in fact, there are some advanced front-running bots which not only monitor the mempool for arbitrage opp opportunities, but in fact handle generic transactions. In other words, they'll try every transaction, see if executing it will give them the money, and if so, front-run you. That's meant that if we try to ex exploit the bug ourselves, we would likely get front-run and then lose all of the money, which would be very unfortunate. In Ethereum is a Dark Forest, Dan talks about how he worked with Scott to collaborate on a solution to try to beat the front runners, but ultimately it was not successful. Uh, I had also been in touch with Scott at that time, and we discussed various solutions for how we might trick the front running bots. So I pinged him again, uh, mentioning, asking whether he'd be interested in giving this another shot. Scott then suggested that we contact Tina, who had been uh, independently working on collaborating with miners for some sort of private relay system. Meanwhile, Lean still hadn't responded to our attempts to contact them, so we decided to loop in Certic as well. Uh, there, was a brief, uh, there was a brief search for anyone on Certic, then we eventually were introduced to Georgios from the Certic team. It's at here that I want to take a brief aside to talk about identity verification. So say you're in possession of a bug that puts a couple million dollars at risk, and you need to contact some people. How do you know whether the person you're contacting is really the person they claim to be. You could just ask them, but then you have to sort of trust them for it. And with so much money on the line, maybe trusting someone's word isn't enough. Uh, there's two things, there's two approaches I found work really great. The first approach is good for verifying someone's professional identity, and that's to simply send a message to their work email. Uh, this works because although it's very easy to spoof an email from a fake sender, it's much harder to intercept an email as the fake receiver. You would have to either perform some sort of DNS hijacking attack against the domain, or hack the person's inbox directly, both of which would be hard to do on, a, uh, on, on the spot. On the other hand, spoofing an email is as easy as sending an SMTP request to whichever server you use and faking the from header. If you want, you could also ask for a reply just to ensure that they do have access to the mailbox and can send a message. But I think generally speaking, uh, if you need to verify someone's identity on the spot and they don't have time to prepare for it, then just sending a code to the email is probably good enough. Uh, sometimes you need to verify contract ownership though. So in that case, what I like to do is just get a signature from the contract employer. Because even if they're not the current owners of the contract, it shows that they at least were involved in the process at some point. Uh, when I'm requesting signatures, I always like to make sure that the message I ask them to sign contains all of the relevant information regarding the operation, uh, whether it be rescuing funds, whether it be sending a transaction, whether it be receiving funds. This way, it's guaranteed that the, signature, the signatory is aware of all the details because they had to sign the message and they had to have seen it. So, Back from the brief aside, we finally got in touch with the anonymous developers, and again, we had to perform a round of identity verifications, even more so this time because they were anonymous, and so we had no way of uh, asserting their identity with any sort of public roots of trust. Instead, we had Alex and Giorgio's verify their identity by having them confirm access to the emails they used during the audit, which meant that even if they weren't the people uh, in charge of the protocol now, they were at least the people who requested the audit. Once we confirmed that we were speaking to the legitimate people, we proposed our solutions. So we said, look, you can either urge people to withdraw, but that's a bad idea because uh, it'll tip off hackers. You can try to exploit ourselves, but if we do that, there's a very high chance that we're going to get front run. And in fact, uh, people have been front run for less. But we have a third option, which is 
we can try contacting a mining pool and doing a private transaction, which will shield us from a majority of the front runners. And fortunately, Lean agreed to go with option number three. So from here, Tina contacted Sparkpool's co-founder, Xiaoping, who offered to help. And again, we performed some more identity verification just to make sure that uh, they were who they, who they said they were. For what it's worth, Tina was already very familiar with Xiaoping, but uh, I, out of paranoia, I insisted that we do some more identity verification because although I had known Tina, Scott, and Alex for quite a while now, I personally did not know Xiaoping or Georgios from Certic. And so better safe than sorry. Uh, it turns out that by a, a stroke of good fortune, Sparkpool had already been in the middle of working on a service just like this. They weren't finished, but they had started. And so my understanding is that Xiaoping told the development team that there was now an urgent need for this to be finished, and they need to get it done as soon as possible. And the team finished the rest of the product in around two hours, which was extremely impressive, a very fast, very fast development pace. So kudos to that. While the Spark Pool team was working on that, Scott and I were working on the final rescue payload. It's here that I want to take another brief aside to talk about liabilities. So you, you see all of these tweets and all these articles about when rescues go right and you save hundreds of millions of dollars and everyone's happy, but what happens if a rescue goes wrong? Who's, whose fault, like, you know, whose fault is it? Uh, how, do you, how do you deal with that? Um, it was it, during the heat of the moment, Scott and I weren't really sure what to do with it. We knew that we probably didn't want to be the ones pressing the button in case something did go wrong, given the uncertainties around both Sparkpool's uh, newly minted service as well as all of the front runners. Uh, so our solution was to have Lean push the button that actually transferred the Ether out of the contract into their account. Another question we were considering was, what sort of tax obligations does temporarily receiving 10 million US dollars create? Uh, we could, in our exploit payload, uh, withdraw all of the ether to our own address and then transfer them to an address that Lean controlled. But then we would have had, we would have potentially incurred an income of 10 million US dollars for a brief moment. And it was in the middle of the night, so we didn't really have the luxury of consulting a tax attorney. Ultimately, our solution was to mint some. Uh, potentially worthless SBT and LBT tokens, these are the tokens that Lean platform uses, send those to Lean and then have them withdraw the Ether directly. Again, uh, I'm not a tax professional, so it's hard to say whether this actually uh, would have shielded us from any tax liabilities, but this was something on our minds as we were developing the payload. In any case, Scott and I finished working on the payload. We decided to split the transactions across two accounts. So in our first account, Note the block number 2710. We sent a transaction to create a new bond group with an empty bond IDs array and a valid maturity. Then in the second account, in the same block, sequentially, note that this is position five and this is position six, we called the exchange bond group uh, function, exchanging our dummy bond group with no bond IDs to a valid bond group with some bond IDs, which resulted in us being minted free SPT and LBT tokens. Finally, we transferred the two tokens, the SPT, the LBT and the SPT, to the lean controlled address. And from there, they withdrew the vulnerable funds. So some takeaways from this incident. Uh, there's a lot more to rescuing funds than just finding the bug. In fact, finding the bug is maybe one of the easier parts. Uh, other considerations include, again, identity verification. How do you make sure you're talking to the right person and you didn't just uh, make the situation a lot worse by leaking the details to a black hat? Uh, also, liabilities. So if something goes wrong, who's at fault? There are no good Samaritan laws on the blockchain, so you need to figure this out yourself. And then, of course, taxes, one of the two inevitable, inevitable things in life. Other things that weren't included in this particular case, but might be relevant, include how do you patch something quick enough? How do you pause the protocol uh, if funds can't be rescued uh, using the exploit? And then also, although at the time private relays were not a thing, nowadays they are very much democratized uh, in the form of flashpots and other private relay system services. So if you ever find yourself in this situation, you can just use flashbots instead of having to reach out to the CTO of a major mining pool. And that concludes 
uh, segment six, Escaping the Dark Forest. In the last and final segment, uh, I'm just going to wrap up this lecture with some quick conclusions. Uh, so I'll see you there.